Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 768. That is 768 of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and I hope you're doing well wherever this lovely pod may find you. I hope you are all doing swimmingly. I hope you are all doing swimmingly. I had my first interaction with somebody in the gymnasium today that could have been described as them attempting to um, vibe me out, to bro me out, to chest me out, whatever that flipping term is. And, you know, it was an interesting exchange because when I'm usually in there and I'm doing my back squats, because my ankles and my thighs are not as open as they should be, right, I still try and do the best I can, make sure my toes are pointed forward and my knees are splayed wide but I've still got some way to go in terms of my mobility so in order to give me some extra help and assistance I sometimes get a plate and I put it under my heels to give me some you know some clearance so that I can squat with my kind of toes forward and kind of push my knees out you know the standard cues that you all know and love well sometimes I do it and I'll tend to go and do it with a template and I've noticed and again maybe it's just my gym I think all gyms are probably the same I've noticed the 10 plate is one of the most popular ones in terms of the ones everyone uses. I think people use a lot of fives and tens in general because, you know, I'm assuming people, you know, find a barbell sort of quite heavy. So to put a five on or a 10 on either side is probably enough to kind of get a good sweat on. Well, I take one. So because I've taken one and they come in pairs and there's probably only like six, probably, probably 10 pairs, I'd say. And I've taken one, it leaves one odd one. So naturally someone's looking for it, but usually it's not a problem. Usually it isn't an issue. Today, I guess it was, um, mostly because I think what people usually do, I've noticed this a lot as well, which is really annoying. You'll have your weights prepared, right? You'll put your stuff that you need to use to the side, but because they can't be bothered to look, they can't be bothered to go and like scurry around and try and find it. They want to take what you've prepared. It's like, nah, I went and gathered all this shit from all over the place because no one puts their stuff back, right? It's a hood. Um, it's the ends. No one's going to put their stuff back. There's signs about putting your things back. This isn't a, you know, because I remember in a CrossFit box, like people were, people would like go out their way. They were running to put their stuff back to show off to the fucking teacher. <clears throat> look at what I did, look at what I did, look at what I did. But in regular gyms, no one does that. No one actually puts their things back. So when, you, when you're trying to find stuff, you have to go like all around the flipping place. You find stuff in the corner over there, over there, over here, everywhere. So I just find it really annoying when you've gone to the effort to find all your things that you need to do your little workout. And then someone's like, oh, can I use this? Like, nah, bro, no, you can't. Even though I'm not using it right now and you can send me something else, no, you can't touch this because I went to go and scurry all around the place to go and find this you go and find your own thing and then they give you like a weird look like oh you're not even using it it's like yeah it doesn't matter I went and got it you go and get your own thing so I had that kind of interaction where it was like a bit of static and I just had to like because usually I'm you know whenever somebody asks me I'm not gonna lie usually I do acquiesce I'm not really that bothered like if I'm not using it in that moment I'd rather just let someone use it because you know there's nothing worse than being in your flow being in your momentum and then ask somebody hey can I use it and they're like no it's like oh you know what I mean but I'm also not somebody that talks to somebody so you know these people are going out of their way to talk to me they're going out of their way to communicate and let's be honest and say you know sometimes when you communicate with people you're not going to get the answer you want you know, it's a flip of a coin. Sometimes you get the answer you want. Sometimes you won't get the answer that you want. So you're kind of playing with fire. But I found that interaction kind of hilarious because the guy kind of had a bit of an attitude. Like, oh, can I take the 10? Like, obviously not. I'm standing on it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I know I'm resting right now, but obviously you can't take it because I'm fucking using it. And then he kind of had a bit of an attitude. And of course, he ended up finding another 10 at another rack. But it's like, bruh, maybe first look around first before just go into the easy option that happens to be right in front of you just because it is and then trying to make me give you my thing that I went to work really hard to go get it's just oh, I don't know humans are fucking annoying now I'm completely understanding why because I, I I I have to be honest like part of like going to a gym is amazing is like it's like the I won't say the social as kind of like social aspect but it's not really because I don't really talk to people but it's semi-social as in you get to see people, right? You get to see people, especially if you're like a work at home type or you stay at home like I do all the time, you get to see other humans. So it's good in that regard. But I now understand why a lot of the fitness, weightlifting influencers and content creators I watch online, why they just can't be bothered and they just end up always, you know, setting up their own shed. They end up kind of, you know, building their own shed and building their own home gym. I get it now. 
they go to all the effort to actually get a you know a garage converted into a gym whatever it may be like a lot of people are doing that it's becoming like a big i guess it's always been a thing but it's becoming a bigger trend i think in the last few years i'm seeing loads of really big weightlifting influencers basically do build outs of like you know home gyms and shit and now i get why they do it because honestly dealing with randoms is so annoying everyone's got everyone has such a weird way of doing things like and maybe it's not weird because it's just their way but it's just everyone is just bizarre you know bizarre bizarre human beings so you're having to deal with all that energy you just want to do your workout and go and you know there must be also a beauty because i'd love to do that one day like have my own home gym and be able to like work out without headphones as much as i enjoy it it's almost you know it kind of cuts you off from the, your environment it'll be nice to hear what i sound like when i'm breathing and shit and all that malarkey because i've always got my headphones on i've always got my flipping beats pro on on my noise cancelling over ears so you know you don't really hear a much of yourself the grunts the groans the weird sounds that you make when you squat like the things that you don't notice so i would actually like to hear that if i've got a chance to have my own place but you know for the time being i have to share it with other you know flipping civilians you know or, or other paws like tom segura would say and it's a bit of a nightmare it's a bit of a nightmare i saw this video clip actually of um lato in the club with kevin hart and usher and this is legitimately one of my nightmares and actually a revelation or no one of my nightmares but also a pretty clear example of what i probably look like when i'm in a club these days because i've always had this nightmare that if you ever walked into a club and you saw me and i was standing in a corner somewhere i'd come across weird because i'm just standing in the corner or i'm standing right at the back with my arms folded you know stroking my chin like a fed or like a literal chin stroker but in some occasions i think i just look like this i just look probably tired that's probably what I look like in this video of Kevin Hart in the flipping club with flipping Lato and Usher. I probably just look knackered, you know, like Kevin Hart does in this video. Nothing even crazy. He just looks tired. Let me play the video for you. There's Usher. There's Lato. <laughs> She's having a blast. She's having a fucking blast. So's Usher. Kinda. Look at Kevin Hart. <laughs> I I honestly think that's what I I, I wish I probably looked like Usher. I wish I had, you know that's what i came across as like just the old guy that you're maybe having a blast and now you're chilling i love the puffer hat but i think in actuality i probably have more similar face and demeanor to kevin hart that's probably why i end up looking like in a club i'm sure of it that's what i'm actually looking like the greys and the beard and all sorts literally just doing the thousand eyes you know the what's it called the, the, the thousand yard stare he's not even looking at anybody He's not even trying to scope any baddies. He's just literally thinking about the way home. He's thinking about if that store's open on the way home. He's thinking if he, if he should pass through flipping Popeyes or go to fucking Chick fil A. He's thinking whether or not his wife is up or not. Is he going to have time to see his kids before he goes to sleep? Is his laptop charged? That's what he's probably thinking about in his head right now, which I've had the thought of in my head. Or sometimes, you know what the worst thing is? You know what the worst thing is? When you're in a club and you start to think about, should I get another drink? Should I have another bump? Should I have another line? Should I, should I, <laughs> should I take a bit more of this pill? Because you're thinking you need something to give you a kick up the ass. Be like, hold on, I'm not in a mood. Like I'm clearly not. Good. Like he's probably had a few drinks in him already. It's still not doing anything. So those other things aren't really going to do anything either. But you're kind of tricking your brain to believe that it will help, but it's not going to help. So you're just kind of like mulling over it in your head. And then you're thinking, oh, okay, cool. So um, should I just stay and just chill? But then the young person next to you, which happens to be Lato, is having a fucking blast. Look at her. She's vibing. She's singing along to all the, all the words of the rap tune because I guess it's one of her songs. She's not even sweating a single. There's not a single bead of sweat on her, right? She's wearing some cotton. And she's got a full face of makeup and she's not sweating. She's having a blast as you do when you're like, what, 25, 26 absolutely loving fucking life stunting having a good time showing off the pearly whites the fucking diamonds are dancing you know having a blast and then to the side of her she has usher who's you know he's doing an okay job of staying in touch you know staying attuned 
but the one that's really a reflection on what it's actually like to party with youngsters is Kevin Hart. That's what it's actually really like in real life. That's what your that's your scenario. And I've had many, many of those scenarios in my life. Honestly, many, 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 too many to flip and mention to the point where you're like, hmm, should I just hang it all up? Should I just decide to like, you know, hang up my fucking magnums, you know, put my fucking rave boots to one side, write my fucking retirement, you know, caption over there on IG and just let it be because nobody wants to be this guy in the club but unfortunately all of us are heading into that direction we are all heading into this direction where we end up looking like kevin hart standing next to lato in the club i think this might be miami during miami design week i think so i'm not too sure because i think all the celebrities are out there at the moment because you know it's miami design week and you know kevin hart's just out here trying to trying to focus trying to remember if he's got his charger should he call his assistant for that thing does he have an email he's got to respond to? He's just all over the place. That's the reality of it when you're out there. It's fucking difficult. But I like it. I'm not going to lie. I think it's a good thing. Um, I think every, you know, you're meant to have phases in your life. You're meant to have times when you're, you know, super lit and going crazy. As Rihanna mentioned, she had a time when she was, you know, letting the nipple go free, you know, having a fucking, uh, the whole snatch out and shit. Now that she's a mum with a couple of kids and shit, she's probably like, you know what? I'm going to chill on that side of things. So I completely understand. I completely understand. So solidarity with Kevin Hart for all the other old fucks in the club who are still trying to hold it down and still trying to keep up with the kids. It's fucking difficult out there. But keep your head up. Keep your fucking head up. Keep your fucking head up. Next, we got this. This is a random one. This is about Lana Del Rey. So Lana Del Rey, during Coachella, decided to blast one of her ex-road managers which was a bit bizarre to be completely honest. I'm not going to lie. At the time, I remember seeing it and I was a bit perturbed as to why did she decide to bring this on to the big stage of Coachella. But I guess because of the performance and because of the entrance and I guess on her side, she's basically assume, she's basically suggesting that the manager quit because they didn't agree with the new design and artistic direction Lana Del Rey wanted to go on. So let me just tell you what it was. So um, Lana Del Rey has some trust words for her former tour manager. On April 19th the video game singer 38 shared a lengthy instagram post expressing gratitude to everyone who made her 2024 coachella performance so memorable she says thank you for fucking everything um jack and jill jack sorry jack and john billy for showing up for me and the band for just killing it and spending months on site on Sailma in 40 degree warehouse to point that it was so cold that i caught laryngitis that literally just left a few hours before i hit the stage because tessa de pietro spent two hours lifting that cough remotely through her body intuitive skills just minutes before the show time wally crowder for all your badass bikes every stunning dance on stage and alex for his beautiful for choreography my stunning free singers who dance and their and sang their asses off in style and high matching boots judah and chelsea she then shifted her tone as she thanked emily referring to emily holt for taking over as tour manager duties after pete quit for no reason after 15 years appearing to shade her former manager pete abbott del rey alleged he was butthurt that i got 10 comp bikes for free from wally and decided he was more of a stage designer than a tour manager never got a phone call probably never will still grateful for 15 years though no worries 37 days was more than enough time to put together an entire headline set by ourselves no stressful at all way to go emily you fucking killed it with grace so you know while bigging up this emily woman who's a new tour manager she also dunked on this former one now, the former manager did reply, courtesy of TMZ, and it just makes me think in general, what's happened to society? Why can't we have conversations? Why can't we pick up the phone and talk to each other? Why do we have to do everything through social media? You know, it's so bizarre. Like this manager's like a nobody. He's like an, in sorry, not a nobody. He's like an industry person. He's not even that front facing, I'd imagine, unless you're like super into, you know, Lana Del Rey law, you would never know who he is. So why did she feel the need to blast him on a very big social media page when she could have just called him and asked him, hey, why did you quit? <laughs> you know, it's not that difficult. But anyway, the manager did reply and he replied as follows. He said, um, a curse of TMZ. Hey, Lana, I just wanted to clarify some things for my perspective. It's not about the bikes or any of that. I've always supported your vision and creativity. 
The decision to step away was more about feeling like my role was changing drastically without much discussion. I love managing your tours for 15 years, but I started to feel like my input was being overlooked, especially when it came to production and stage design. I wasn't just upset about the bikes. It was more than the direction that we're heading in. I wanted to talk through these changes and how we could work together to find the best solutions, but it seemed like those conversations never happened. It's important to me to feel valued and heard in my role, and unfortunately, that wasn't the case anymore. I'm grateful for the incredible journey we had together over the years and wish you all the best for your future projects if you ever want to talk things through I'm here best Pete for Pete it's obviously good exposure because everybody knows who his, na his name and everyone knows that he was you know heavily involved in you know not only managing Lana but obviously some of her you know design and artistic stuff and she, he kind of for, for what it sounds like he was kind of like a manager and also a creative director so that's a pretty good you know, look for him because everyone knows his name. He's become more vocal. He's become more visible. But if you're Lana Del Rey, surely at this, at your grown age, if you're 38 years old, you should be able to pick up the phone and, you know, have a, have a word. But I think this speaks to a growing trend in society overall. We all don't have conversations. We love to subtweet. We love to sub Instagram. We love to maybe even text, but we don't actually have grown up conversations when we actually have a disagreement with somebody. Like, hey, I didn't like what you did that day. That thing that you said the other day didn't land well with me. Bloody, when you mentioned the other thing, what did you actually mean? Like, we don't actually have upfront conversations. That's probably why ghosting is so popular. That might explain it. Ghosting has become so popular across the board in friendship, relationships, workplace, educational, probably. People just prefer to do that because it's easier, quote unquote, than actually having that hard conversation with somebody, looking them in the eye and saying, hey, this is why I did this. This is why I did this. Or, or I'm following somebody, right? Ghosting, unfollowing, blocking is much easier than just having a conversation, which is the hardest thing to do. I guess to counter that, some people would say, oh, I don't owe everybody an explanation for the things that I do. Fair. But I think if you were friends before, if you were colleagues before, yeah, you do kind of owe that person a conversation. You do. I'm sorry. You owe that person some words. You don't just owe them just like, you know, blocking their number, deleting them, refusing to speak to them or just ignoring them completely, you know, or not picking up the phone or speaking through social media. Like, come on, bro. You owe that person a bit more, especially this person who's worked with um, Lana for 15 years. That's probably 15 years of her, you know, that's basically since she started her career, essentially. Um, so you were there during the really important parts of her career. You could say you were definitely responsible for helping her get to where she is at obviously her talent is the most important thing but you definitely played a role yeah you definitely you definitely deserve a conversation i think you definitely deserve a conversation so it was kind of poor from lander ray to treat a guy like that maybe there's more to this you know maybe there's more layers to this maybe it's not just what they're talking about but either way you know it was a weird thing that i saw happening in real time but big up lander ray anyway she still smashed it at coachella she still smashed it at coachella so um an update regarding Grimes. Allegedly, Grimes is saying that she's going to make a comeback. Grimes is really eager to prove to everybody that that performance that she did during Coachella week number one was a flip, was a, you know, was um <laughs> was a one-off occasion. She decided to tweet earlier that who's ready for Coachella weekend two? I'll cap the disarray, the, the disarray, disarray, the disarray at a maximum 10 seconds per song. I don't know if there's ever been more rehearsed or fine-tuned grime set and I made another Blackpink remix for good measure. I love that she's saying these things as a way to kind of get a pat on the back. Bruh, this is the bare minimum. You're meant to rehearse. You're meant to fine-tune your sets. Like there was time when I was DJing often that I would sometimes even go as far as recording my set. I would play through the songs, just kind of like give it a rough idea. I wouldn't go through and mix every record like I was going to mix in a club. I'd kind of do the rough outline. So I'd record it so I could see how long it was, number one. And then, I, and then what I would do is that when I would go for a run, I would play that set through my headphones. So I'd listen to it on my run so that I could figure out, okay, cool. Is that song, should I kind of mix that song in in two minutes? Should I mix it in at five? Should I reorder stuff? Like, because usually that's what I like to do. I just like to kind of, it's not really about the song. It's more so about the vibe. So if I start off slow, maybe when I put the, my headphones on and I'll go for a run, I'm like, you know what? No, actually, let's start off really fast and then slow it down. So it's just kind of about sorting out the order and getting the sequencing right. 
but that's what I used to do back in the day. But then most of the times, you know, everyone, for the most part, I know I have, you have a MIDI controller. And even if you don't have a MIDI controller, you could do it through record box. Record box has an option where you can basically view your songs. Like you're looking at it in you know, a like CDJ and you can kind of load the songs and then kind of get a rough idea if they work on it and kind of cue them, mix them together and shit. So there's really no excuse for, for fucking up nowadays. There isn't, it doesn't exist. If you fuck up, it's more so because you didn't rehearse. Um, you don't know your equipment properly. And even nowadays, I would say, um, pioneer cdjs are way easier to use now than they were in the past in my personal opinion i think the ones where you had to put the cd in that version let's say from number 400 and up they were really hard to use nowadays these cdjs are super easy to use especially if it comes to syncing your tunes um they've all got features that allow you to sync your tunes there's some of them that allow you to unquantize things so if the beat grid doesn't click it properly you can mix it in differently like it's pretty decent like in terms of what it does so if you fuck it up it's just like you didn't watch enough youtube videos you didn't read the van the manual and you don't give a fuck so let's play the clip anyway this actual video is actually pretty cool um the actual funny thing about this as well this comment she made i'm also thinking now i wonder if she did this on purpose i wonder if this is all part of the plan because coachella is now doing two weekends i think there's some of the big festivals do this now anyway right they have like weekend one weekend two it gives the person a chance to maybe present a new show a whole complete I don't know. It depends. What, what what depends what kind of artist you are. If you do a lot of things, probably it's probably not worth to try to do a completely different set the second week. It's just gonna take too much work. You're just gonna fine tune it, right, and whatever it may be. But to do a completely different set from head to, to bottom, it just doesn't make any sense. And that's what I would do probably if I was a, an actual artist. I'd probably go as far as doing like you know maybe do the B sides for the first weekend and then the second weekend do all your hits obviously you know Coachella might not like that but I think that's what I would probably do but if you're Grimes maybe because you fucked up so bad week one weekend one you only way up the only way is up now so if you do the bare minimum you're gonna smash it but maybe she did this on purpose because she's a bit of a mess right looking at her right she looks kind of eman emancipated she looks like she's on all manners of fucking prescription drugs god bless those kids that she's raising with elon musk and shit she looks all over the place so it's probably not a surprise that her dj sets were all over the place also it's just what she does so maybe that's part of the aesthetic or part of the plan get on the mic have that really whiny fucking privileged voice and shit talking shit and then the second weekend come through and absolutely kill it with these crazy visuals and crazy remixes and shit as you said about blackpink and stuff maybe that's a plan I mean Like in case you, you're not seeing what you're seeing here, but basically there's a there's a screen behind her, and it's got an AI, I guess, in, well it's got like a you know a, a digital a digital video of her, what looks like to be Grimes, and it looks like she's like stuck behind like a glass wall, and she's like dancing behind it. It's a pretty cool um, visual effect. I'm not going to lie, it looks really impressive. But this is not this is not this is not Coachella. This is another festival. I don't know what festival it is, but it's not Coachella. Yeah, big up coil in the chat. Yeah, you're right. I shouldn't care, but her lisping about it instead of fixing it pissed me off all the way. Yeah, her getting on the mic was far worse of an offense and kind of just like just kept on ranting than the actual thing. If you just would have played it off and just continued. I don't think, you know what that's funny as well? I don't think most people noticed. <laughs> I swear to God, most people in the crowd wouldn't have noticed if the songs were double the BPM. They just would have kept on dancing. Most people don't actually know what's happening, you know, at a deep, when someone on the DJ is playing, unless the song, the, song mu the, the music cuts off. So she would have just powered through. I think it would have been perfectly fine. But she actually made it worse by getting on the mic. And then when you heard her voice, like, you're like, fucking hell, shut the fuck up, please, if you don't mind. But yeah, whatever this feature is, it's pretty cool. So I'm I'm eager to see if she's going to do this going forward when she does come back for week weekend two. Will she have these visuals? Because this this will be a pretty good way to redeem yourself. Because you know, 
people love visuals um i actually like that bar there's like an led bar and the spotlights around it it almost looks like a window or a door's opening and she's trying to get out that's pretty cool i'm not gonna lie so people are gonna love this especially that kind of crowd you know i, I think we've seen now like a lot of those edm type of you know big room business techno dudes have done really well during Coachella. They've kind of done some pretty amazing shows. They've done some really pretty amazing fucking visuals. So it wouldn't surprise me if she decides to kind of, you know, let's fucking remind these motherfuckers who I am because I still can't get, you know, I still can't get my head around personally how somebody has, you know, I wouldn't say, I say maybe, you know, as somebody who's able to create such great albums, you know, as like Visions and Art Angels back in the day, how that person could be so fucking dumb now and so lacking in artistic creativity, merit, and just panache and whatever it may be. It just seems like a, a, a maybe it's a lifetime ago that she did Our Angels, you know, Our Angels was what? Maybe 2015, 14. Visions was probably 2013, 12 or something. So these were, these, these albums are like more than 10 years old. So maybe that's probably why we're seeing what we're seeing now because it's been 10 years since she dropped anything mean what meaning meaningful and she's you know her circumstances have changed she's now become basically a billionaire by default of having kids with fucking elon musk so maybe that's the reason why she's not as good anymore but i just can't get my head around it like how does the person you know how does the same person who made fucking you know flesh without blood um i don't know oblivion how is that same person, the person that's unable to fucking play CDJs and get her tracks to sync on a stage? It doesn't make any sense to me. It really fucking doesn't. This shit always fucking happens. All my tracks are twice as fast, so I'm not fucking <laughs> very well. But I'm going to keep trying, and I appreciate you guys being here. She kind of sounds like she's not English, like she's not from America. She kind of sounds almost Bjorkish, but she also kind of sounds a little bit like Caitlyn Jenner's daughter or something. You know, like, I, I don't know if that makes any sense. She sounds odd. Very, 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 very weird. I know maybe it's, maybe it's a Canadian like, French accent. Maybe that's probably what it is. Maybe it's a Canadian, maybe. I don't know. But I don't think that's an excuse. She just has this weird, annoying kind of flappy nature, like almost like the kind of, the person that you're bumping, the, the the annoying girl you bump into at a hotel somewhere, you know, at a hostel somewhere, right? The the one that's like overly sharing all her fucking travel exploits, and you know she's wearing those fucking horrible drop crotch yoga pants that people that travel a lot wear. You know she's got a backpack that's got all these weird trinkets hanging off them. When she walks, it's like a fucking carnival, bells and little clicks and tambourines all over the place. You know. She crosses her feet and she picks her feet when she's talking to you in a hostel somewhere. Just annoying. There has never been a drag show without a major technical difficulty. But there's never been a drag It will continue. And just don't blame me. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. I kind of understand why Elon ditched her. I'm not going to lie. Elon impregnated her and just ran away. I kind of get why Elon did a black guy, you know? I kind of get I kind of get why Elon did a fucking, you know, a deadbeat on her because imagine dealing with her day to day. <sighs> <laughs> this is insane it's like no it isn't insane it happens all the time sometimes you're playing and i don't know sometimes I, I've, I've you know i've used cjs a lot but mostly now in recent years because of pirate studios and sometimes you rock up to the place and the person that used it before changed the settings it's not quantized um when you load the tracks it automatically it automatically starts all you need to do is a quick google and you'll figure out the solution it's usually just holding one button down and after a while, if you if you keep running into the same issues, guess what? You have a troubleshoot list of options or, sorry, you have a troubleshoot list of solutions that you can kind of run through to kind of deal with your issue. It's not that deep. So this, her being like shocked, that kind of reaction she has to it is proof that she didn't touch the CDJ. She hasn't touched the pair of CDJs in maybe months, which is again criminal because I don't know about you, but being a fucking quote unquote up and coming DJ and wanting to play more often, one of the things that I've always kind of longed to have is a pair of CDJs at home. 
like just a pair of CDJs at home with a good fucking mixer. That would be the fucking dream. So I could, you know, mix and fucking record shit until my heart's content, practice all the time. So that when the chance, when the chance does come about to play a bigger place, I'm ready to go. This woman probably has a fucking sick setup, a sick studio, an amazing fucking pair of CDJs, maybe even the fucking Virgil Abloh designed ones, the transparent ones. She probably has those. But you prefer not to play them, just let them gather dust, and then you turn up and play blindly. Like, I, I, you know, I've had a, again, I don't usually do it because I take my, all my gigs seriously. Like, even if I'm playing in a flipping pub, I'm preparing an entire set for it. You know, I'm taking all my fucking cables, I've got spare this, back up that, back up this. But even me, I've had some occasions where maybe I'm playing in a pub somewhere and I just, you know, haven't really practiced that much. And it's nerve wracking pulling up because you're like, oh my God, is this going to go well? Is it not going to go well? I can't imagine the balls you would need to have to not practice and just turn up at Coachella. Not because this Coachella is the most amazing festival in the world, just because of the amount of people that she's standing in front of. That's like, what, 15,000 people or something? Can you imagine the balls you'd need to stand in front of 15,000 people knowing full well you haven't prepared your set, you haven't played or practice zero you're just going off vibes only <sighs> this woman is a better woman than me i'm trying to do the math they're kind of unmixable if we can't i'm trying to do the math i'm gonna go back to okay the rest of the mixes are actually she kind of sounds like xqc she has the same like inflection and annoying voice like xqc like, yeah, she sounds like XQC, the streamer. Like, they have something about them is quite similar. Maybe it's the way they look. Who knows? It's going to be a bit crazy, y'all, because... <laughs> I... I'm doing the last song about... Trap, a song. And something in record box fucked up. If anyone... Or maybe Jordan Peterson. She sounds like she could be Jordan Peterson's daughter. Maybe maybe Michaela, Mika, Michaela, Michaela Peterson, the daughter. Maybe her voice is too deep. Maybe what Jordan Peterson's daughter should sound like is Grimes. It's kind of like, you know, want somebody think of the DJs? Want somebody think of the women? What am I going to do? It's like, what? Oh really? Okay, cool. Quite is saying that allegedly um she blamed a lot of her tech issues on her ex boyfriend. Again, that's fucking insane. To rely on I don't know, from what I understand of Grime, she doesn't have that much of a crazy tech setup anywhere she's playing. Yeah, I know she's into AI and all this sort of shit, but it's not that difficult what she does on stage. It's some sort of projection, it's something to manipulate her voice something to play instruments through maybe a midi player maybe some sort of audio interface whatever it's not that complicated so she, she, for her not to be able to know how to plug in you know whatever she needs to use into a fucking you know into an audio setup is pretty unforgivable especially when it comes to cdjs all you have to do is press play she could have she, if she wanted to right she could have just pressed she could have played like she's just playing a playlist just have all the tracks like have the tracks queued on both cdjs and then just play one after the other without even mixing just sort of using the the levels as like a fade in fade out and it would have been perfectly fine no one would have noticed but i'm trying to do the math the math like what <laughs> what an idiot Speed and I have not practiced the math. exactly what are we gonna do with our serato exactly. what are we gonna do with our miracle box <laughs> What are we gonna do with our USBs? <laughs> yeah, oh my god, crimes. Because I'm not fast at math. But I am going to. I am going to. What are you going to do? This? Jesus. Right. You know what must be weird too? You know what must be also weird? The whatever stage she's playing on is probably the stage where a lot of people DJ. So it must be freaky to go there at Coachella as a fan. And to hear someone's voice anyway, it's like, what the fuck? Why are you talking so much? Because I already know, like, if you check out Boiler Room and whenever there's, like, a set where there's, like, an MC, 
the comments are brutal, especially when they're black, obviously. <laughs> but just in general, right? Um, dance music, electronic music, people hate vocals. They hate vocalists. They hate MCs. So can you imagine how grating it must have been for that collective of people who hate people talking on the mic, hearing her like, yeah, so you may want double track. It's like, bruh, shut up and just play the songs, man. However fast they are, however slow they are, just play it and make it work. <laughs> she's still talking <sighs> you gotta love her man she's a fucking mess you know what being bad at math is not a sin <laughs> what the fuck that was actually me that time that was actually me so allegedly you know what's really funny though someone posted this clip allegedly of her back in the day this is some from a person called it's rocket it's Pocket Rocket. They said Grimes up fucking up on stage is not new. She did the same thing in Mexico City with losing control over BPM, then constantly apologizing and then getting cut off mid Genesis. That's a good thing, actually. I'm not going to lie. If I'm a, a festival organizer, a party organizer, and I've paid Grimes however much she gets paid for a booking fee, what is a booking fee? Let's see if, if people have it, actually. Let's see if we can find it. Grimes. Let's see if, we, if someone's got it. DJ booking fee. It's probably going to be like $10,000. Something stupid, right? <gasps> what? No way. They're saying her, her fee is anywhere between $75,000 to $149,000. What? Who's paying that? God almighty. Fair play. Available. Let's see. Well, who's this one? This is main stage productions. Okay, they've got the whole list of how much people gets paid here. People are getting paid 30 quid, 30 fucking thousand dollars an hour. God damn. Okay, cool. Well, if you pay her that much money, right? If you pay anywhere between like 75,000 to 150,000, you're probably within your right to cut her off if she's fucking up. Like, enough. Like, do you know what I mean? I've already overpaid you. You're not going to ruin my fucking festival or my rave by paying this horrible set. So, get fucked. So, I can understand. That must be a really gratifying feeling as a fucking festival organizer to cut her off. Like, you know what? Enough with you. Go home. <laughs> I'm going to play you guys a new song. <laughs> she seems fucked as well. Like, make sure I am in a technically correct situation <laughs> uh, because that was a complicated uh. situation. <laughs> now I believe this should work. See, the songs are so good, though. That's a problem. The songs that she makes, her artistry is such a high level that you kind of want to put up with the mess, but God, that voice is so fucking great when she's talking. I'm also wondering, right? I'm getting to a point where I'm wondering. I wonder if part of this mess that she does on stage is her getting bored of not being seen or heard. Because that's something that's quite, that must be quite limiting for an artist, right? To DJ. Making the transition to be an artist or DJ must feel like a bit of a downgrade. It must feel a bit lame. When you're used to like commanding the stage with a mic in your hand, singing, rapping, whatever you're doing, right? It must feel a bit like a downgrade to go behind the booth and just silently look down and be pressing buttons and playing other people's music. It's not the same. You probably, the euphoria, the hype, whatever, um, the adrenaline that you feel singing is probably way better, way different than it is DJing. So maybe the reason why she does all this shit and has all these technical difficulties because he gives her an excuse to get on the microphone. Hey, you remember me? It's me, Grimes. Remember? You love me, right? Remember me? The artist you used to love? Like, that's probably why she does it. She just gets bored. Like, okay, no one's listening to me, not paying attention. Let, let me remind them where I, who I am. Let me remind them who I am. But it does kind of remind me of this one time where I had a really bad malfunction where I was playing, I think, at a, like a hip-hop. Yeah, this is, this is something that I don't do anymore. But when I was playing at a hip-hop party somewhere in central London, 
I think this was back in the day when again, like you know, I've got a I've got a history of having very dodgy MacBooks. So I had one of these white MacBooks, right? So I had um I don't know if you guys remember the white MacBook. So I had one of my first MacBooks ever was a white MacBook. And obviously it was fucking secondhand as well, right? So I had this white MacBook that I used to use when I was DJing. And I guess it just wasn't powerful enough to run my DJ software and also plug into the audio visual to, to the mixer in the club. But I didn't know that because I was practicing at home. So I was using this MacBook from, I don't know what year this MacBook is from. What year is it actually from anyway? This white MacBook is from, what year is it? 2006, whatever that year. 2006, 2012, right? This white MacBook. I was using it at home to DJ on my MIDI controller. And that's when I used to play with a MIDI controller. So I'd, I'd, I'd take my laptop and I'd have like a Pioneer MIDI controller. I think I had a Pioneer or maybe no, I had a Newmark MIDI controller. I had an old Newmark mix track. That's the one I had. Yeah, I had a mix track pro. One of these, yeah, that's the one I had. That one. This is one of this is a basic ass one. I think everyone that started to DJ would have had this mixer. It's a Newmark mix track pro, right? Pretty basic, pretty run of the mill. So I had this mixer um and my lap, white laptop and I was playing at this fucking place at, at like a hip hop party. And it went horribly wrong because for some reason the MacBook didn't have enough juice in it to work with the mixer that I was using in the club, right? So every time I plugged in, every time I started the fucking DJ software um, on the fucking mixer, on the laptop, sorry, every time I started it, the fucking laptop would shut down. And it kept doing it again and again and again. I was playing in front of a live audience. So I start my set and I'd play a couple of tunes and then the, the fucking software would crash. And it, was, and it only happened then. I was practicing at home. I did it before. I recorded my set. Nothing happened bad. And the moment I went to go play in a club, it just kept shutting down, shutting down, shutting down. And then it got so bad to a point where after that fourth time, I just got told to leave. <laughs> Because I couldn't play anything else and it felt so fucking depressing to go back home with all my shit carried with me after only being out for an hour or so. But that also taught me a valuable lesson that I have to obviously carry backups. But most of all, it kind of got me onto playing more so on CDJs because I think back then I really wasn't confident playing CDJs. I don't even want to play on my, on my MIDI player. But obviously the issue is that you have too many points of error. You have a MIDI player a MIDI controller, sorry, that could fuck up on your way there. Like you could go there and you could spill a beer on it. Some lever could break, whatever. It's too much points of error. You've also got a laptop that's old that could also break. So it's just, there's too many options there that could fuck up. But at least when you're playing on a pair of CDJs, all you have is USBs. And then obviously if you have a backup, you take maybe some CDs with you in case that kind of doesn't work. But usually backup, you know, a USB and a backup one and CD is probably enough for you to be able to play in most places. And then even if it doesn't work, you can just blame the equipment and the equipment isn't yours so you don't look that bad and you'll still get your fee. But when you rock up with your own equipment and it doesn't work repeatedly and everyone's looking at you weirdly, it can get a bit mad. So that was one of my only nightmare sets I've had. And again, that was literally like a one-off because I always check my stuff and go through it before I leave. But actually when I was at the place, it just kept shutting down. It was absolutely crazy, man. Really, really crazy situation. But um, big up the Newmark Mix Track Pro. By the way, I also want to say, as an aside, I remember there was a time back in the day where people would kind of shame you if you rocked up to a gig and you had a fucking MIDI controller. That was like a thing. It's like, bruh, do you know how much CDJs are? Even fucking CDJ 800s, they're like £600 each. They're not cheap. So the people that could afford a whole setup in their homes, you know, they must have some wonga and it's not the majority of us. So if you want the ability to practice your set or just to learn how to DJ and whatever, or just DJ for fun, MIDI controllers are quite good because, you know, they're an easy entry into playing. And also, I don't think that's a marker of whether or not you can DJ or not. I don't think it's a good sign. People say, oh yeah, if you if you can if you can't if you use a MIDI controller, it means you're not good. That's not true at all. We've seen fucking Grimes playing on, you know, possibly she's up there on Coachella stage with probably four CDJs in front of her, a CDJ nine hundred or whatever else in front of her, right? The best monitors, the best speakers, um, you know, like whatever. She's got a fucking fan behind her to cool the system down and cool herself down. The best setup and she's still fucked up. So this idea that MIDI controllers were like um amateur is insane because you have a woman there who gets paid 
you know, 75 grand upwards to play and she can't play on CDJs. Like, I'd much rather take some guy playing horrible MP, horrible YouTube rips um, of MP3s on his MIDI controller than having Grimes get on mic and say a lot of nonsense and try and fucking, you know, appease the fans or comfort them, even though she hasn't practiced. Like, the tools, I, I think, in general, are not a reflection ever on someone's skill or someone's ability. You always, always look at the output. I think the tools are what people use or what they use. And I think, unfortunately for us, especially DJs, it's just an unfortunate thing that the equipment that we use is just so expensive and there's not much competition. That's the issue too. Pioneer doesn't have much competition. They're like the, they're the one monopoly because that's the club standard gear, industry standard gear that everybody uses. But there's no one else that's making a CDJ that's comparable, that's cheaper. Denon make one, but they're quite expensive too. No one's buying a new Mark CDJ. So they've kind of got a bit of a strangled hold on the industry. So if that's the case, the next back option, if you want to practice, you know, or just do your thing or have some fun at home, is to buy a MIDI controller. And buying one, I don't think is bad. It's a good thing, actually. It actually means you fucking care about music and, you know, and whatever, and you're just doing it for fun, whatever, and you're hunting your skills. And I've noticed myself, especially I've got a new one. I've got a, a, a newish one. I've got, a, I think I've got a Pioneer. What have I got? I think I've got a Pioneer. Is it the, what is it? Is it SSB or something? Is it SSB? Is that what I've got? Yeah, that's a controller I've got. Yeah, I've got this one. And I've noticed for me that it actually, I, don't get me wrong, it's not the same as playing on CDJs, but it does work. It does help. It helps. It's better than I think. You get the opportunity to like, you know, go through your tunes, fuck around, see how it works, whatever, maybe. So it does actually help. So um, for those of you out there that are, you know, struggling to get on and want to play and do your thing, you know, getting a pair of CDJs is not a good. Getting a pair, getting a mid, MIDI player, a MIDI controller, sorry, is actually pretty handy when you're first getting started. It is going to give you ability to kind of, you know, practice, do your thing. And then you could take those skills that you've learned because the setup and the layout of it is kind of similar to when you're going to use an actual um, pair of CDJs in a club and an actual mixer. It's kind of like the same sort of thing. So once you kind of master this, you can master anything really. So um, I love it. I fucking love it. Continuing on, we've got this interesting news courtesy of the BBC regarding these videos i'm sure some of you may have seen them so on tiktok or just on instagram there's been this new trend of this guy or i think a bunch of guys going around different parts of the uk main cities london manchester liverpool newcastle whatever it may be and recording these nightlife videos where you just rock up your camera and you take videos of people going in and out of clubs right or coming in and out of bars just in the city center and i don't know at first they, they seemed pretty cool they were like an anthropological study um, of society and the different trends, especially if you compare those videos to like people who record videos, you know, in some, you know, Main Street in fucking, I don't know, is that Texas or wherever that place is in Austin or in Miami or in places like, you know, in Korea and shit and maybe in places like Japan and comparing it to other places in Europe, it's quite cool to see the difference in trends and the similarities and shit people in nightlife. I guess for some reason, it's now evolved into this other conversation around these videos being creepy. I never got the creepy thing because, you know, it's not illegal to film people outside in public. And if anything, like I said, if, if what the comments I saw were a lot of people saying, oh shit, there's actually a, quite a lot of flipping attractive women in, in England. Because I think people always assumed for some reason, all of our women look like fucking, um, you know, Susan Boyle or something. So they were quite impressed to see the range of the different types of women that you see out in London and shit. And just in general, just as a voyeur myself, it was just quite fun to just to see people, you know, going in and out of clubs and doing what they're doing. But I guess if you're the women in, in the videos, it can seem a bit strange when you're like rocking up to go to a club and you see some white, you, it's obviously a white dude, but you see some guy with his tripod just standing there recording you as you're going in and out of clubs. It can be a little bit unnerving. So I guess now it's becoming like a thing. And the BBC have did this report where they're saying women are feeling unsafe after being secretly. And again, I don't think it's a secret recording. The guy actually uses, if I'm not mistaken, he uses an SLR with a really long lens. Like, it's not secret at all. Like, he looks very bait. I think someone took a picture of him. It's like a short, white-looking dude. Um, he uses a really long SLR, and he actually looks like a fed. You know, it's not like he looks like he's blending in, like he's a hipster or something. No, he looks like an older dude who's just recording people. So, for some reason, people don't like it, and they're obviously, I guess, now trying to get it banned? I don't know. It's fucking bizarre. The, the, it's, for me, it's like, I understand the women's part of it feeling unsafe, but it's also another example of why we're such bad vibes. Like, no one can just have some 
fun. You know, it's always got to be turned into this other thing. It's like, come on, bro. But anyway, let's read the article. Women in the northwest of England say they feel unsafe after videos taken of them on nights out without their knowledge have gained millions of views on social media and attracted a slew of misogynistic comments. So, how are you going to protect people from how? I know it's not nice to get misogynistic comments or abusive comments online, but how can you prevent that? It's almost impossible to prevent some guys from saying something shitty to you online. And especially if it's somebody else's video of you in public it's like what can you do like what do you want do you want to do you want to, us to turn the internet into a police state like be careful what kind of authority you're trying to welcome in because that could have some really far-reaching ramifications i understand why they're upset about it but let's you know let's rein it in a bit police say they're now trying to actively trying to catch the person making the videos <laughs> why are they got catching to do what to see other videos of other people walking down the street like, they are asking anyone who's been filmed to come forward. Meg23 of Manchester was a victim of the disturbing, disturbing social media trend. <sighs> the makeup artist and TikTok influencer said she was filmed on a night out in Manchester. She said she did not realise she was being filmed until she saw she was sent a link on the video. I didn't see him. I didn't know I was going to be recorded. I can't believe I'm being targeted in that way. He looked at me and thought, yeah, I'll video them. It's not that deep. He just stands outside of club. Honestly, I've seen the video of him. Someone took a picture of him. He there's some videos of him where he's literally standing in the middle of the road. It's not, he's not, it's not like not bait. He has a tripod. He has like a big fucking SLR with a massive lens on it. It's not like he's recording you with like a fucking pinhole camera or something. The video footage, as you can see from the screen grab, is really good. Like that's a lens that is able to bring in a lot of light, you know, it's capturing them in their full essence. Like that's just not some, you know, run of the mill thing. So if you didn't see him, it's because, you know, you're paying attention to where you're going, which makes sense. But let's not make it seem as like he was recording you secretly. It's like, hmm. Um... And also, you haven't been, like, this victim complex, I've been targeted. Tar like, ugh, come on, give it, give it a rest. Meg said she was filmed while walking down Dean's Gate with two women she did not know. She had noticed that they were harassed by a group of men and offered to walk through them. I just walked with them to get a taxi so we were all together. I just ended up having a little conversation with them. The video of Meg was posted later that night by a stranger. It's one of a dozen uploaded on a platform like TikTok and YouTube. The clips were, which are often titled Manchester Nightlife or Liverpool Nightlife have racked up millions of views along with an abundance of misogynistic comments. I have no words really other than it's just made me feel a bit sick. Honestly, man, people are so fucking sensitive so sensitive it's unreal i understand if like the videos are like, getting pervy like you know you know what pervy videos look like but somebody filming you from afar while you're on your way to the club is dumb especially when you're you decided to wear what you don't like i don't know if this oh it's a violation of what i'm wearing it's like but everyone's seeing it so what's the difference between people seeing it in a club and someone seeing it on a video that they recorded outside especially if the, you're not being tagged no one like i don't i don't know i think all this has been blown out of proportion to be honest until there's actually a threat trying to preempt the threat and trying to make it seem like this guy is a what is a pedo or a creep because he's standing outside in public and record it's like then if he's a creep then what, what are we going to do next are we going to stop those guys who i think people probably would though those guys who ask people questions on the street and shit is that, is that, is that the same thing because they start recording you before they even ask you permission so are we, are we going to start with them as well or is it just a guy recording these videos i don't know um, it's just not nice at all and obviously not just in a selfish way but also towards other women yeah true that's what you care about all of them are really really young <laughs> uh, isn't that more of their issue whose issue is it that these young girls are going out at night and then going to nightclubs shouldn't you be going to the clubs and telling them to stop letting young girls in so they will stop going outside so that he can stop recording oh god Maybe even underage girls not knowing that they're being recorded. The videos of the girls feel like falling over and having their underwear. But it's not the same as that, though, because they're not showing their... Un Honestly, this woman is fucking pissing me off. The videos of the girls are, is like falling over and having your underwear on show and stuff. Them being posted online like that, something needs to be done about it. But it's not the same, though, because you're walking down the street clothed in your outfit you're going out on. That's not the same thing as tripping over and everyone seeing your knickers. Like, what? Great, imagine the police say it's actively working to catch the people making the videos. Catch the people. It's one dude. 
Uh, they're acting as if he's fucking as if he's Jack the Ripper or something man this motherfucker needs to relax um, officers are being briefed on the situation if you if you if you want to do something maybe rest, try and arrest the people that are leaving you the bad comments but you know trying to arrest this guy making it seem like he's fucking you know some serial killer is insane um, da 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 a lot of people speak on their phone as though they're walking past. We don't know if they're videoing or not, if it's going up the street. So it'd be quite, oh, but that's not true. Okay, now they're making it seem like he's on the phone video recording them. That angle, this angle that I've got on screen now where he's facing three girls, that's not him pretending to record it on his phone. That's clearly somebody has set up a camera on a tripod or is holding it very still. That's not how you get a video of somebody. If you've ever recorded on the slide with your phone on your ear, that's not how the phone turns out. It doesn't turn out that way, the, the video. That's somebody recording it with quote-unquote professional equipment. Fucking hell, even the police are chalking out of their ass. We don't know if they're video or not, if they're going to the street, so it's quite hard. We don't know. It's easier to know. Come on, police officers. Oh, anyway... PCCU said one woman had approached him about being filmed. Exactly. What'd she say? She said he had a little like Ray-Ban glasses at the corner of his camera that flashed red. He, what? He had Ray-Ban and, and at the corner of his... So that's what a camera does. She said he had like Ray-Ban glasses on and at the corner was a... Oh, they're saying he was recording it with fucking um, Google lenses. The Facebook... The face fucking Snapchat cameras. So it's like the Ray-Ban... Was it Ray-Ban Snapchat? I don't think that's true though. The footage of it is good. I've seen it, but it's not that good. This is an SLR. So they're alleging that the guy is wearing these glasses, these collaborations between Ray-Ban and Snapchat that have um, cameras in them that are really good. Now, before they look kind of clunky, but now they look really good. I don't believe it. I don't think that's 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 true. I think he's actually just wear, have a regular camera in his hand and he's just, you know, out here filming hoes. But yeah, I don't know, man. These girls are just complaining about nothing. Um, blah, blah, blah. See, um, one of the comments here on the actual post, somebody said, busiest STD, STI clinics in the UK. Never thought the UK are such beautiful women. So we have a problem with these com If you want to ban somebody, try and get whoever this guy is. And again, is that, is that, is that a crime to say this, a, like to make this comment? Is that... Is that a criminal offence? Should you be locked up for saying busiest STD, STI clinics in the UK? Like, what? We're locking people up for speech now, yeah? Is that what we're going to be doing? Cool. Chief Executive Stephen Wiggins of the GMP seat of Manchester Central District urged anyone who's been filmed off... Don't, look, at he actually looks like he could do the filming. I'm sorry. Chief Stephen Wiggins looks like he's the one at the end of the camera or he's on the other side of the camera. So trusting him to deal with your issues is probably a bit risque. He's probably recording you while you're talking to him. We are very much up against it. We don't we don't get that intelligence, that information coming from the actual victims' communities themselves. We have interviewed we intervened recently on a number of occasions where we had males acting suspicious in a city centre. So our plea for the organisation, people to ring us if they see anything suspicious behaviour in the city, and we'll make sure that we will be there. Charlotte from Trafford Rape Crisis. Jesus, what an organization. Trafford Rape Crisis is calling on social media platforms to shut accounts down. She said, victim blaming nature of the comments made it harder. It absolutely is a direct casual link to sexual... What? She's saying there's a link to that to sexual violence. It absolutely is a direct link to sexual violence. Huh? These sort of victim blaming com com commentaries introduce another level of shame. That's because of a barrier to women accessing support. TikTok and YouTube said that they have removed a number of videos and accounts related to the content, violating guidelines. A TikTok person said misogyny is prohibited. So what's the difference between this video and the people that film those like walking tours? What's the difference? The ones that do like, oh, walking through Reykjavik, walking through Krakow, walking through Prague, walking through, pa like, what's the difference between that and this? Exactly. Honestly, I don't know. I get it's unnerving. I get it's weird if you're a girl to see suddenly yourself on a night out, you know, because you don't, you know, you don't usually get that type of footage of yourself, right? In general, um, you try, you just basically go out and come back out. And sometimes you don't actually even take pictures of it. So you just want to go out, have a good time and come back home. 
So kind of seeing yourself on video on a night out can be a bit weird, especially if you didn't record it. But I don't know, man. People need to relax. People need to fucking relax. It's not that deep. But again, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm fucking wrong. Moving on. We've got this um, article here, which is really interesting, courtesy of Sky News regarding Richie Sunak's interesting pledges to, in order to, <laughs> to get the vote for the next fucking election. Absolutely crazy. So Richie Sunak, UK, UK Prime Minister, said the following. He's pledging to remove benefits for people who are not taking jobs after 12 months. Now, on paper, I kind of agree with this. But when you get into a nitty gritty, this seems like a really odd thing to do and an odd way to combat, you know, unemployment, to combat whatever situation we're in financially, if it's a recession, whatever it is. It seems like an odd way to go about it. But it's interesting how whenever they want to try and claw back money, governments and stuff, the people that get punished the most are the poor. It's always the same thing. It's never taxing the rich or whatever it may be to claw back some funds because you're going through a bad time. It's always, let's attack the poor first. They're the ones that always have to pay the price and they end up paying the price in the big way. So the article says as follows. People who are fit to work but do not accept job offers will have to their benefits taken away after 12 months, the Prime Minister said. Outlining his plans for reform the welfare system if the Conservatives win the next election, that's a mad thing to outline, right? Where everyone's hungry, everyone's going through some sort of struggle, and you're saying, hey, if you vote for us, we're going to cut your benefits as, a, as, as like an incentive. Some, most people aren't going to vote for this because it seems a bit mad, but you never know. Outlining his plans to reform the welfare system if the Conservatives win the next election, Richie Sunak said unemployment support should be safety net, never a choice, as he promised to make sure that the hard work is always rewarded. That's true. I, I agree with that. It should be a safety net and not a, an option. But unfortunately, with you know, with it, how hard it is to fucking even get entry-level jobs nowadays in most places, service industry jobs, and the fact that people get taxed an insane amount of money as they gain more experience and start to earn more money, those people that do the whole, you know, what you call it, um, benefit scams and shit, I see why they do it because there is little incentive to actually get a legit job when after you get taxed, you end up with fucking 900 pounds when you could do the same thing just sitting on your ass and scratching your balls, just claiming benefits, you know? That's the issue. So if I, if I was them, if I was the Conservatives, to really try to kind of sweeten this deal, I'd be like, hey, this is one side of my proposal. I'm going to cut benefits and I'm going to make sure that if you don't take a job after 12 months, your benefits get cut so you get forced back into work. But I'd also say... I'm going to lower the tax bracket or the tax amount that you pay if you earn over a certain amount. So that would give people an incentive to get back into work. Because at the moment, looking at the UK tax bans, right? Look how fucking crazy this is. In the UK, if you earn between 12,517,000 per year to 37,700 per year, you get taxed 20%. But in the moment you start to earn over 37,000, which I think a lot of people do, because, you know, if you work long enough in the UK, you've got enough experience and you're not a dummy, it's it's easy to get a salary over 38, over 37, 701. It's not that difficult. This is usually people's like first mid-level job with a bit of ex with a bit of responsibility and shit. So a lot of people are making this amount, 37 plus, but then they're getting taxed 40%, which then weirdly enough makes you your take home shit because then you end up not really get, you know getting what you should be getting out of the 30 the more you're fucking earning and sometimes it's probably more beneficial like i've done in my past when i've worked and stuff i've sometimes purposely gone for jobs that i'm probably overqualified for just because it allows me to sit at this tax bracket and it also allows me not to have as much responsibility and i can kind of come in and go right i can kind of you know clock in and clock out type of thing but obviously for the company, it's not a good thing. For me, career-wise, it's not a good thing because I don't really get to push myself or learn new skills because I'm kind of, you know, operating under my level. For the company, they don't get to a chance to kind of exploit my skills and get the most out of me in order to kind of help their bottom line. And everybody kind of suffers. So if the government actually said, hey, we're going to cut benefits, cool, but then we're going to lower the tax bracket, let's say to 30% over this and amount, that would make it quite appealing. But just telling people that are on benefits and struggling anyway, after 12 months, if you don't take a job, you're just going to get back into fucking, we're going to take away your benefits, doesn't do anything. It doesn't solve the issue, in my personal opinion, because there's you need to kind of address the reason why these people are on fucking benefits over 12 months anyway. Like, what the fuck is going on that they can't find a job within 12 months? 
yeah that's what you need to figure out and then when you when you see that you probably realize that just taking away the benefit of the 12 months doesn't actually address the issue but again i could be wrong mr sunak said the government would be more ambitious about helping people back to work and more honest about the risk over medicalizing the everyday challenges and worries of life by reducing or sorry by introducing a raft of measures in the next parliament they include removing benefits after 12 months for those deemed fit to work but do not comply with the conditions set by their work coach which is fucking funny like it's hilarious as well because they're assuming you're getting offers that's the funny thing they're assuming people are getting offers within 12 months there's probably people there that haven't got offers in 12 months maybe even over 12 months so in order to you know in order to get the job in the first place you need to be applying getting interviews which is obviously not also guaranteed it's just a funny way to go about doing things it can another one tightening the work capability assessment so that um, those with less severe conditions will be expected to seek employment a review of the fit note system to focus on what someone can do to be carried out by independent assessors rather than gps i guess this is introduced because for my led to understand i didn't know this is a thing there are people in the workplace especially in the uk who definitely exploit the sickness thing, thing because we're quite depending on the company you work for the uk is quite lenient when it comes to how long you can be off sick i think it's like two weeks or something which is quite wild so a lot of people are probably exploiting that taking a piss especially post pandemic you could imagine people like you know you know lying about having covid and shit or having long covid and taking mad amounts of time off so that's obviously not good changes to the rules so someone working less than half of a full week um, will have to look for more work fucking hell they want they want everybody out there on the fucking you know they want everybody out there in the mines in it they don't want anybody sitting on their ass a consultation on pip um to look at eligibility claims and target support such as offering talking to therapies fer to talking therapies instead of cash payments talking therapy you know it, when people <laughs> the last thing you want when you're poor <laughs> is therapy you just want money you want food <laughs> you want a warm blanket introduction to the new fraud bill to treat benefit fraud like a tax fraud honestly bro can you first arrest white collar criminals please what's happening with the fucking royal mail and then with that scam maybe put those guys in jail first instead of jailing to make a fucking benefit fraud the same as tax fraud it's fucking wild there's going to be loads of mums around the country going to prison for like 20 years <laughs> because they put on a claim that they've got four kids instead of two wow bro maybe arrest some of these fucking you know um mps and shit like that woman who had a council house and sold it you're not meant to sell it what the fuck is going on here he insisted the changes were not about making the benefit system less generous adding i'm not prepared to balance the books on the backs of the most vulnerable i'm not prepared i'll say i thought he said i'm prepared or oh, i thought he said he, he is prepared that would have made me laugh he said i'm not prepared to balance the books on the backs of the most vulnerable but you are doing that you fucking dickhead instead the critical questions are about eligibility about who should be included who should be entitled to support and what kind of support best matches their need honestly man they are brutalizing people out here but labor said that it was the tories handling of the nhs that had left people locked out of work and dis and disabled charities called measures dangerous yeah it's fucking crazy it is fucking crazy but you know i guess they're trying something i guess they are trying something all right let's talk about this so i've, I've mentioned earlier on whore or horror Hura, the radio platform the live streaming platform in berlin went through a bit of an issue where in the past they were accused of rightfully so of basically deplatforming people and essentially co-signing the genocide that's occurring over there in gaza by um t telling djs that were playing and showing support for the for palestinians to remove their scarves remove their t-shirts and support you know whatever it may be it was pretty crazy and a really dumb misstep because even though the founders of Hor are Israeli and I think one of them or both of them served in the IDF, I understand the conflict of interest that they have. But considering how fraught the you know the situation is over there, considering the videos that we keep on seeing, just considering the brutality, the violence, the amount of people dead, I think at last count I saw like thirty thousand Palestinians have, have died during the war. You know, large scores of Palestine are completely been reduced to rubble. There's this video that I've just recently seen actually 
that features Palestinians, you know, swimming out into the fucking raging ocean to go pick up, you know, the aid that's been dropped from fucking planes, right? And to carry it safely back so their families aren't so they can eat. You see visions and videos like this and you think to yourself, fucking hell, bro. The situation over there in Palestine is really fucking crazy and really sad, really fucking tragic. This is and the people of Gaza. You can see how much dangerous the situation here. They are just literally dying. And the thing about this as well is that this is actually the safest way to get aid to them. Because if you try and drop this aid inland, there's a danger it might land on somebody and kill them, which has happened a few times, especially during the stampedes. And if you then decide to drop it, you know, too far out into the ocean, people might die swimming trying to get it. And of course, there's the other option, there's the other danger of Israel kind of firing missiles and kind of shooting down the aid in the first place. And that also is kind of wasting, you know, the food and whatever that's being sent there. So the situation is incredibly fraught, is incredibly sad, and just really tragic to kind of see. It's really, 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 really bonkers. So if you're Hua, I just can't understand why you would go as far as trying to remove people's t-shirts and stuff when they're trying to show solidarity and support for people who are going through what they're going through, right? It's really, really crazy. So with that being said, with that being said, they decided now to kind of change the narrative and basically pretend to be like supporting Palestinians and have this compilation CD that they're putting out, which is basically titled Whore for Palestine Volume 1, or I guess, no, uh, featuring various artists. And the idea behind it is to have all these different artists in, you know, in electronic music, one of them who I'm a big fan of being Matrix Man and a few others on there, you know, putting um, specific songs on there and obviously selling the compilation and whatever money's raised could get sent to a charity, you know, and whatever it may be. The issue now has come, obviously this is very, you know, tasteless, very heavy handed, um, also doesn't address all the missteps they did in the past. Um, and it just feels a little bit fake and a little bit fucking disingenuous in the first place. To make matters worse now, the update is even more, more infuriating, right? Is that the charity that they alleged to kind of linked up with to kind of support in, you know, in support of their compilation called Heal Palestine made it abundantly clear on social media that they have nothing to do with this. They put out a statement on their Instagram and I think Hoa now have kind of abided by it that they have absolutely nothing to do with this and they want nothing to do with it. So Hoa are trying to do the right thing, but they don't even do the right thing of contacting the charity that they want to get in touch with. They just decide to do it anyway themselves and then just hope for the best going forward. Like, can you imagine how fucking weirdly misplaced this whole gesture is? It just goes to speak to the lack of care that they have anyway. They don't really give a fuck. They're just trying to appeal like they give a fuck because the boycott is clearly hurting them. Because I hadn't really paid attention to what was going on post the first time they were deplatforming people. Obviously, I saw it. It's like, oh, that's fucking horrible. But I hadn't really been checking whore that much. But I guess the reason why I haven't been checking them is because they haven't been making anything worthwhile because all the big DJs or the ones that we all know and love and respect have all decided to boycott and aren't on there anymore so they probably still have people on there still playing obviously they have a full lineup there's no djs you know there's there's too many djs out there who don't get a chance to play who be willing to play for hod regardless of what they do but the ones that matter the ones that move the needle the ones that actually get them the views and whatever they're the ones that are kind of staying away and i guess they're feeling that and maybe even locally maybe it's affecting them ability to put on events whatever they're definitely feeling something which is why they did this it's just a reaction to try to get back on people's good books but obviously it did terribly and now they didn't even fucking partner up with the charity actually like they said they did and the charity said we had nothing to do with them so now Ho had to put out a statement underneath the you know the, as a caption to kind of clarify what's happening because they made it seem like they were working in cahoots with the charity but now it's not really that case so Ho's update the team at Hill Palestine reached out to us and declined the donation but they did not specify why <laughs> it doesn't matter why like like you made it seem like you were in cahoots with these people because they said oh we're going to give all the proceeds raised for the you know again it's a dumb gesture because who the fuck's buying a fucking whore compilation anyway i love the artists featured on there especially matrix man but no one's buying you know a compilation with like tv like tv out like really in 2024 we're like we don't give a fuck but anyway regardless and how many tracks is there anyway a 11 track like comp come on 11 track compilation 
with those names. You need some more. You need probably a couple of Hector Oaks and stuff. This is not enough. So the team at Hill Palestine reached out to us and declined the donation, but did not specify why. According to their website, there are two ways to donate to Hill Palestine, starting your own unauthorized fundraiser on their page or donating funds directly to them. So I guess they're trying to argue, we don't need your permission to give you money. Right, we're gonna use because I guess that's what they're doing. They're using they they're using Hill Palestine for clout and to give them to give them validation. <clears throat> but they're also saying, "Hey, do you want to really turn away money? Like you, you purport to be for Palestinians, you purport to be for the people of Gaza. Or do you really want to turn away free money or quote unquote money to give to people that they could use it in need? Oh, it's gonna be a bit of a tetchy, isn't it? But." <laughs> I just love the I just love the line, but they did not specify why. They sound so upset. Starting your own authorized fundraiser on the sorry, according to their website, there are two ways to donate to Heal Palestine. Starting your own authorized fundraiser on their page or donating fund directly to them. We intended to choose a second option. For many of our past fundraisers, we haven't contacted the organization beforehand to ask for approval or permission to send these funds, as many of them have the option to receive funds directly online. Well, they say they don't want your money, bro. So what are you going to do? Are you going to send it to them by force and then try and put them in a corner, back them in a corner? Because if they give the money back, some people are going to say, no, just send the money to the Palestinians because they need it. If they say that, if, if you publicly state that you're going to give them money and they publicly state we don't want it, you just have to take the L. Honestly, who's in charge of pause PR? Do they have a PR person? Do they have a, somebody doing that? Because this is shocking, the amount of own goals. Like, part of me, right, can sit here and say, even though it sounds insane, I can understand how conflicted they kind of were in the beginning, if they actually are Israeli. Again, I would love somebody to fucking let me know why there are so many Israeli people in dance music anyway. It seems wild how there's just like so many people from that one part of the world that are really not even a part of dance music, the scene. They're actually in the industry. They own the clubs, the labels. Like it's interesting like how that is. I don't it's not I don't think that's the case in any other genre. Like obviously there are, you know, people of that denomination, specifically Jews, in, in most music of music, but I mean like as artists, as DJs, there's so many Israeli people who are in techno and house music and just dance music in general. So if anybody knows why that is the case, definitely let me know in the comments if you do. Um but anyway, that being said, I understand in the beginning of the conflict if they felt conflicted about having people on their platform with incredibly pro-Palestinian messaging and slogans and shit on their shirts when their people themselves, right? You know, Israeli people are also suffering in the beginning, in the beginning, in the real beginning. But since the beginning, since that hello day that, you know, there's a lot of Israeli people kind of cling to in terms of the horrible scenes at that music festival that everyone condemns, obviously. But since then, the... The, the, you know it's been kind of lopsided the amount of people who have passed away in terms i mean it's not it's not you know there is nothing to relate there there's no correlation there's no balance or anything it's obviously mostly palestinians who are losing their life mostly women and children it's fucking crazy it's mostly civilians also by the way just as a broad term so i understand at the beginning feeling conflicted you you got this platform that you own seeing people basically you know essentially taking the piss out of your people um on t-shirts and shit and maybe offending you i get it feeling conflicted but telling them to remove their shirts and shit that's a bit too much we're not gonna we're not gonna upload your video because you wore this shirt you have to take off this scarf it's like what the fuck bro such a terrible public relations pr you know bad move really is i don't know what they're doing i really don't know who's managing their pr but they're doing so bad horribly at it and now it's almost like they're trying to what battle or fight this charity here it's like if they don't want your money like they can then decline it and i think actually trying to forcefully send it to them when they've said they don't want it is actually worse to be honest but what do i know to be clear, we never announced a collaboration with the Heal Palestine or fundraiser in their name and our communication. However, we posted themselves. Okay, this is the thing though. Again, I don't like this from Whore. They don't seem to have any accountability or take any ownership. You didn't say it was a collaboration, but you made it seem like it was. You know what you did. Everyone does it. I think everyone that does like charity stuff kind of does it the same way wording wise it depends i guess like whatever you know what the lingo is when you're trying to pu push something they didn't specifically say it was a collaboration but it did make it seem like it was 
So come on, don't take us for fools. Our intention is to adv advocate for security, safety, and to help for everyone. Mm, no, it isn't. At this moment, we chose to help those who are currently experiencing tremendous suffering as we always strive to contribute to what we can. You know what's funny? They're only doing this now because the death numbers, the numbers of deaths on the Palestinian side are just so crazy that even the most staunchest Zionists nowadays are tr are basically walking back their stances now. They're kind of like, okay, maybe we should be brokering some level of peace or ceasefire because this is getting crazy. Are we literally trying to exterminate these people? Because before it was, you know, tit for tat kind of thing. But now it's gone so far that even the most staunch Israelis out there are like, this is too much. So I wonder if Hall would have done this anyway, if it just would have continued being quite, you know, tit for tat kind of thing, for lack of a better term. I don't think so. They're only now starting to reverse course because we're seeing videos of like women and children splayed all over the floor when a, you know, a fucking hospital gets blown up. Or even worse, that footage that we saw of drones, you know, blowing up innocent civilians just walking across the fucking deserts. It's like, what the fuck is going on here? These people don't look threatening. They don't look like they have their bearing arms. They don't look like a fucking militia. That's not Hamas. So because of that, now they're basically feeling a little bit bad, basically, and trying to walk it back. It's like, that's too late now, bro. Regarding the ongoing fundraiser, we have already contacted several humanitarian organizations and work in Palestine to ensure that our contribution will be received. We'll keep everyone updated. Yeah, do that. Do that if you want to. Keep it to yourself. We don't give a fuck. Thank you for ongoing support and for the people who brought complication together. Your contribution and actions are making a change. So those of you who wish to understand our stance further, please read the pinned statement on our page. Yeah. But by the way, blessings and godspeed to the people featured on this list because their comments must be crazy the people featured on here must be getting absolute pelters let's see if i can see it, it, somebody tagged here because i bet you people must be going after them as well who's 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 on here let's see adja let's see if people are people saying anything crazy to this person called adja on their instagram had they turned off their comments or something let's see because Hora now you know not only fucking up the whole thing but they also putting other people in bad positions because now people are going to be attacking them, making them feel like, you know, they are complicit in, in fucking whore's shit. So this is, a, I think this is a pin post, isn't it? So I won't think there'll be any comments on there. That's a pin post. Right? One hour ago. What's that people say? On a Sunday night. Okay, cool. Nope, that's a pinned one. That's not the one. That's from March. Okay, she doesn't have any, she doesn't have any updated things. So no one's really attacking her, I don't think, so far I can see here. she's She's gotten away with it. So big up Ad Adja. Adja's gotten away with it scot free. Good to see, actually, to be honest. That would have been sad if she was getting attacked in the comments for <laughs> lending a tune to a compilation that probably no one's gonna listen to him anyway. Um yeah, no comments on there recently. Let's see one more person on here. Let's go for Tash Safari. Let's see if anyone else said anything to them. Because this is gonna be a wild thing. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Did Tash Safari get any comments about lending her name to a compilation oh comments have been limited yes okay something may have happened here comments have been limited maybe something happened <laughs> uh, fucking hell look at who are making people's lives hell that have nothing to do with what they're doing fucking hell yeah maybe something happened maybe it hasn't who knows either way um just a terrible own goals continually it feels like from whore they don't seem to learn their lessons and it just seems to get worse and worse for them going forward. Let's actually see my guy Matrix, man. Let's see if he's got... Did people give him any powers? He'll probably give it back to you, to be fair. He's, he's, not, he's not afraid to get into a bit of a tit for tat online and shit. Did anybody else did anybody give him any powers? He's got a massive head, in it? My guy Matrix, man. His head is really big for his body. Look at his fucking dome. Look at his dome. Um, Let's continue there. Nope. Okay, no, no um, angry messages from people my favorite album so far you're a genius wickedness okay fair play fair play fair fucking play so um i'm eager to see what happens with hall going forward um whether they suffer the same fate that boiler room suffered where you know reputational damage just seems to be irreparable but i think boy room have done pretty well in terms of bouncing back i feel like people don't really give them as much stick as they used to maybe it helps that the founder left 
that founder that everybody hated at Boiler Room, the guy with the blonde hair, I forgot his name. Um, I think they hated him just because he was rich or something, I think. Or maybe his family are Tories, I don't know. But either way, I think that founder's left now. I think he sold it to Dice in the Boiler Room. So maybe that might help. Maybe Horn need to sell the platform to Boiler Room or somebody just to kind of distance themselves from the Israeli founders. Because the same thing happened to E1. I think people are going to boycott E1 until E1 changes ownership hands because, you know, they know who the founder is. They know he went literally to fight in Gaza recently. So I think that kind of stink is just impossible to shake off, especially when you keep doing these low effort, hanging fruit, virtue signaling nonsense to try and appease people. It just seemed disingenuous. People can see through it and it's obviously bullshit. It's obviously, obviously, obviously freaking bullshit. Moving on and to end, we have to we have to continue and clarify and play and let it be known that Drake Push Up has officially released on all streaming platforms. Drake Push Up is now or push ups is now available on all streaming platforms. It's official. No more leaks. Um Drake put a stamp on it. He put a name to it. He directed his bars directly at people. He didn't speak in innuendos or in hints or whatever. It was very direct. It was very upfront. And now the pressure's on Kendrick and others to reply. Um there's a rumor going around now that allegedly Kendrick is aiming to fucking drop an album in May with the reply in it, which I think is too long. He has to drop right now. He can't wait until fucking May. That May shit isn't going to run. But that's allegedly the fucking rumor that's existing out there. And that's courtesy of the New Rory and Moore podcast. New Rory and Moore sat down and they said that they heard through the grapevine that allegedly Kendrick wants to drop in May. That's when he's going to have his reply and clap back to the Drake push-ups record. This is them speaking about it. I really thought Kendrick would have replied by now. I am hearing that he has an album coming in May. I see that being a smart move, and why not put the response on an album? But why? Well, if you let Drake tell you, <laughs> you know exactly why. That he was just using this because he needed it? I said, if you let Drake tell it. They've been calling me a dick rider for like 12, All right, 12 so days. Out of song. I'm tired of riding dick. I'll let y'all tell it. Where do you? <laughs> I'm tired of riding dick. It's funny. Um, that's a weird way to go about it, isn't it? Usually war, when it comes to beefing, it's usually dub for dub, record for record. It's never done this way. You never just like, oh, I'm going to diss you on my album. Wait for my album to drop. It's like, that's corny. That's almost like click the link in bio to hear my opinion or follow me on Snapchat to hear my views. It's like, go away. Just tell us what you think right now. Don't try and take me to OnlyFans or to Patreon. Do you know what I mean? It's almost like that's what he's doing. It's almost like he's doing the Patreon way. I don't like that. Um, so I would prefer it if he just like replied back. But I guess this, you know, maybe this goes back to what people are. Some people are suggesting that Kendrick didn't really think Drake would reply the way he did. He kind of, you know, he kind of, you know, fucked him up in that regard. He didn't expect it. So maybe that's why he's taken way longer now to reply because that reply from Drake was very direct, was very thorough, was very detailed, was very rude. If you read between the lines about who he's talking about and the stuff that he's mentioning and shit, he basically said, you know, Kendrick's like an errand boy for Top Dog, which I understand. I believe the errand dog for Top Dog thing. I'm not going to lie. Um, Top Dog does look like somebody that would fucking take 50% of your publishing. Now that I've been familiar with LA guys, especially pun from community and stuff, LA dudes are kind of grimy. LA gangbanger dudes are very grimy. They're very, they're manipulative. Like the whack one, whack one, 100 is a good example. So I get, I wouldn't be surprised what Drake said about him, you know, Kendrick allegedly having to pay $50 million to get out of Top Dog and he still has 50%. I think Top Dog still takes 50% of whatever Kendrick makes doing his own thing. It wouldn't surprise me if that's true because he looks like the type of guy that would take 50%, you know, and would make you pay him 50 million to get out of the deal, regardless if your friends are not like some, you know, real bully boy shit. So I'm actually wouldn't be surprised that being true, not be surprised that thing being true. Keep hearing about this album coming in May. I just spoke to a little birdie. <laughs> What type of bird? Was it a butterfly? It was a, it was a blue jay, I think. Can butterflies be? Oh, wow. In the un Yeah, the mention of the wife thing was wild. The mention of the wife thing was wild, but I love that level of rudeness. That also explains to me why Joe, sorry, why J. Cole didn't want to get involved because he knew where it was going. He knew that somebody would say something about him personally that he didn't want to be out there and he, would, he, he didn't want to be involved. 
because I don't think anybody had any because uh, I think Kendrick did mention on some of his albums that he cheated a bunch. I think that's the what's that that's what the that's what the big stepper album's about, right? It's kinda like Kendrick's four four four. He did mention about cheating on his wife, but I don't think anybody thought it was the other way too. I don't think everybody anybody assumed or had a feeling or knew that his wife might may have done it too in the background with allegedly the fucking security guard or something. But yeah, all is fair in love and war likely hypothetical event that kendrick does not reply are we gonna move the goalposts for him like we have a lot in the past or is this boogeyman persona done and the way we spoke about cole where all these braggadocious bars don't hit anymore you've had so much time to prepare why is it thursday about to be friday well, well to be and fair we haven't gotten anything exactly yeah no the boogeyman thing definitely is gone because i don't know like people look, i don't think it's a boogeyman thing it's gone i think people just underestimate how good drake is that's the reality of it. It's not even nut hugging. It's just the the fact like you don't become that good. You're not that you're not that popular, especially in hip hop. You're not that widely loved. You're not in everybody's fucking Spotify raps if you're not good. He's clearly good. He's clearly very high level when it comes to rapping. People just don't like it because it's packaged in the Drake package, and people just don't like him as a package. It's understandable. But take away him as a person, he's a really good rapper. And I think people are reminded of that. Like, oh, he's actually got, you know, he could actually go toe to toe, blow for blow with this guy. I think the idea that it would be a landslide was dumb. Um, and it's way closer than people would realize. If anything, what it shows you is that, you know, Drake is probably on another level to him because he can do what Kendrick can do. If he wants to do all that boom bap, introspective, you know, um, esoteric kind of backpack rap, he could do that. But can Kendrick do what Drake does? Probably not. That's the main difference between the two of them. So that's what probably gives Drake the fucking edge if I have to say what my top two or top three is. Um, but yeah, what do I know? Kendrick, we believe, has been planning this for quite some time. And now that you're saying he may have an album in May, this was probably his rollout and has been prepped for it. Why didn't you come no, the weekend that Drake's this leak? But yeah, um, regardless, I'm happy the fucking song's out. It's available now on fucking all streaming platforms. So check it out. As you can see it on the screen, check it fucking out. It's fucking hard. But there's this really funny and interesting fucking theory that's been floated out there. Courtesy of, let's see the account if I can find it on here. Courtesy, no, courtesy of this account here. This account called... Where is it? If I can see it. No, there it is. This account called Almighty. So this person called Real Al um, Real Almighty, right? Real Almighty. Real spell R E A L. Almighty spell A L M I J H T E E on Twitter. He has this really interesting theory about why all these guys hate Drake, and it's a funny one because there's probably some validity to it, not all the way through, but probably is some theory why Drake may own a percentage of kendrick and other people's publishing fans have started speculating and are trying to put the pieces together so let's read the thread joe Budden podcast sparked the theory whoops um the other day that drake may own a portion of gamma music company and get splits from the artists signed to them besides gamma it's also possible that drake splits from umg artists here are some reasons as to why that could be true first let's look at the look at the artists beefing with drake and who they're signed to Rick Ross is signed to MMG, Gamma, Nav, Republic, UMG, Weekend, Republic, UMG, Metro, Republic, UMG, Kendrick, Interscope, UMG, ASAP Rocky, RCA, Sony, Future, Epic Records. Now let's start at, with Gamma, owned by Larry Jackson. Budden says, while forming Gamma, Larry told him his plan is to find the Avengers and create content mega house. Drake is speculated to be the Nick Fury of the Avengers in that he's the one getting shit moving and happening. Hmm. There's Larry Jackson, there's um, Drake, and there's Tim Cook from Apple. Keep in mind, Larry Jackson has known Drake since he worked at Apple before forming Gamma. Drake, Apple, and Larry have been good friends for years, with Drake even having an Apple Music deal. If Larry was going to pick anyone to be his Nick Fury, Drake makes the perfect sense. Um, this is a quote. It says, Meanwhile, Apple's head of content, Larry Jackson, happily gloated to Journal by saying that Drake's success in the streaming service was a result of him constantly promoting the album to both his and Apple's large audience, suggesting Apple believes other artists should do the same instead of making deals with Tidal or Spotify. Here's a list of Gamma artists. Funny enough, multiple of these artists are people who Drake has recently collabed with or surrounds himself with. Sexy Red, Four Bats. Budden also called Larry Jackson during his podcast and Larry commented that he thought the cease and desist was funny. 
On top of that, Ross partnered with Gamma in September 2023 for his collab album with Meek, released a month later. Drake hardly promotes his new music. No, that's not true. That's not true. Drake rarely promotes music on social media and his peers. Now, Drake promotes a lot of music online. He does. He, he Drake actually does a good job of that. He does promote people's instant mu albums on his stories all the time. This isn't true. Uh, besides that, Drake also has made it evident in various lyrics throughout the years that he owns ownership and partial ownership over some of these artists. So here are some quotes from Drake that he's alluding to. It says, I need some ownership if we press and go because business is booming on behalf of me. I need a bit out of the apple like Adam and Eve. Hmm. On Little Wayne's family feud. Another one on Drake away from home. Who the CEO of Universal? They mistaken. Because Google say Lucian, but that doesn't make sense. Who filling up the piggy bank? Who bringing home the bacon? Hmm. Another lyric that might allude to it. Was that the only one? Is that the only one? That might be the only one. Cool. No more. Um, let's continue. Uh, duh, duh, duh. Now let's focus on UMG. The, in 2022... Drake linked, sorry, Drake inked a huge four hundred million dollar deal with directly. I didn't know about this shit. Four hundred million dollar deal with UMG, who owns Interscope, Kendrick's label. It stated that one of the biggest deals in history. Michael Jackson previously held the record of the largest music deal. His deal was two hundred fifty million. But that's mad. So that means, imagine if Michael Jackson was still around now and still relevant, what kind of deals he would get. And also, 250 is probably 400 mil in like these mon today's money anyway. 400 million. Fucking hell. No wonder Drake's albums sound the way they do. No wonder they're always a bit all over the place, like he's going through the motions a little bit. He's just too rich. How can you make a good, how can you make a good, concise, quality body of work when you've got 400 mil from a label? Not including your streaming money, not including your show money, not including your merch money, not including the money you make from OVO, the drinks, the bars you own. It's just too rich. It's impossible to make good. And I think it's, I think it's honestly impossible to make any great art after you've earned a certain amount. It's just not possible. I don't believe it. I think part of making great art is almost surviving is being on the breadline is almost it's like suffering and shit without that you don't really get it so it's, it doesn't make it's not surprising that drake's not been able to really you know lock down that classic album that we're all kind of waiting for although i feel like for the dogs was quite close for the dogs was quite close um keeping the topic on mj we obviously know drake compares himself to pop king often mark jackson also had ownership of ever several artists catalogs yeah true um, when Michael Jackson bought the ATV category in 1985, he not only acquired rights to the Beatles songs, but also to the rights of Elvis, Bruce Springsteen, Rolling Stones, Cher, and Little Richard songs. Can you imagine the amount of money Michael Jackson made when he got those people's catalogs in the 80s? Elvis, Bruce Springsteen, or Bruce Spring Spring, according to Brendan, Rolling Stones, Cher, and Little Richard. Gamma and UMG are owners of Republic and Interscope UMG. The Weekend, Rick Ross, Nav, Metro, and Kendrick are all signed there. Could this be why they're all mad at him? Is Drake getting a piece of everyone's pie? I think this is partly true. There's probably some truth to this, but I also think it's just like every rap brief. It's also involving girls. It's just, it's, also, it's this, which is jealousy, money, but also involving girls. It's just obvious. It's just too obvious. You know, this is the fact. Like, these guys probably get annoyed that their main girls, their baby mothers, their wives, their side itches just keep talking about this guy all the time. I think that's what drove Kanye crazy after a while. When Kanye was hanging around with Julia Fox and all those girls, it was probably getting on his nerves. All of these, because, you know, that was probably the one time he, he hanged around with a woman that had other friends and shit, right? So he was around, like, regular New Yorkers, regular women, regular people doing their thing. So it probably annoyed him, especially, or even when he was with Kim. That house fucking loves Drake. I can imagine they're playing that shit all the time in the background. So if you're somebody that secretly hates somebody, but you don't, but your family doesn't know, but then they keep playing that person's music they secretly hate. I could see why you hate them, you know? Like, it could make a lot of sense, especially if their main girl is, like, playing them when before you get to the house, she's got them playing through the fucking Sonos or the Bluetooth speaker. Like, I think that's probably the reason why they hate the guy. So partly to do with money and also to do with the itches. Um, but, yeah, 
the full details of Drake's UMG deal never released, but it's given that this music best biggest of a deal, it's possible Drake received more than just money. Yeah, this is probably this probably makes a lot more sense too. Maybe he didn't get just four hundred mil. Maybe he got four hundred mil and you got better splits, you got better, you know, percentage of like the streaming numbers that come through for his music. Cause if you're Drake, let's say that yeah, let's say if you're Drake, right? And let's say you can say, let's say you can demonstrate or illustrate that you are responsible for like 60% of the traffic that goes to Spotify. You probably want more of the money that they're getting from there, you know, because you're the one that's getting most of the traffic on that platform. Most people that are going to use your Spotify, the first song that they play is a Drake song or within the first five songs, however you fucking rate it. So he's probably got a right or a reason to negotiate better terms for himself because he's the one that gets most of the fucking leads so that makes sense and then maybe going forward maybe they'll say hey let's not give you more of a cash advance at the beginning let's give you more of a split at the back end i could see that also but yeah regardless of what it is um kendrick must respond kendrick must respond i don't care what it is kendrick must fucking respond because the album sorry the track is out there it's in 4k you can see it available now on fucking youtube there's no fucking denying that this is real everybody that was doubting it like you know this fucking corny manager guy that was out here saying oh it's not real the canadian never respond responded after a decade and being dead to come outside still has yet to officially claim the response he's now taunting and uh, attempts to garner reaction if you if you enjoy microwave meals that's on you we preferred cooked food out here fuck off whoever you are dj head you're fucking cornball well the song is out now the song is out now what you say now what are you saying now okay my friends that is it that has been the agassino's english show episode number what is it seven six eight thank you so much for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company and to enjoy our time together. If you've enjoyed it too, please make sure you smash the like button for me and you leave me some comments down below. Or if you want to email me, you can via the links available in the show note description. But it's been a pleasure, never a flipping chore to hang out. Um, obviously, if you're listening to it, it'd be the audio side of the podcast, you'll hear my tune today playing underneath my voice. The tune of day today for me will be this remix, um, courtesy of DJ Academics' page, actually, I Spice Fisher remix um, featuring Cash Cobain. So I'm sure most of you guys are aware of that tune. If you're not aware of that tune, then you need to get tapped in very, very flipping quickly because this tune is a fucking slapper and it's probably going to be everywhere um, as soon as the fucking video drops, which I think is somewhere soon. So that's going to be my tune today. That's going to be playing underneath my voice right now. So thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you guys all again very, 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 very soon. Peace. Take care, everybody. Have a good one.